welcome to this week's Blue Mondays. Blue Mondays is where we take a look at national, state, and local news through a progressive perspective. Tonight's show, we have a very special show for you uh, in store. Uh, tonight, I've asked uh, two of my counterparts on the Lafayette Parish Democratic Executive Committee to join us and give us their thoughts on the election results that we've just received. Uh, those uh, two individuals are Anthony Fazio and Tommy Gilbo. Both of them have some unique perspectives that they'd like to share with you tonight, and uh, I'm definitely looking forward to it. So, we're going to have an entire show uh, brought to you tonight on news. So, as always, this week in the news. The polls have closed, and as of our taping time, the Democrats now control both the United States House and the United States Senate. Uh, in the House, it looks like we're going to have at least a 30-seat majority, probably even more as these uh, different race results come in. Uh, we still have a few that are out. As of uh, recording time, there are, still, there are still 10 seats that have not been decided yet, so it'll be quite interesting to see how those seats play out. Even with the 30 seats, though, we'll take it. That gives us a clear majority in the United States House of Representatives, and uh, there are going to be some interesting things that are going to come of that. In the United States Senate, uh, George Allen uh, has just conceded uh, his seat uh, from Virginia, from the Commonwealth of Virginia. So guess what? That means that the Democrats now will control the Senate. In the Senate, if you, for those of you who are accounting, we have 49 Democrats, 49 Republicans, and then two, two independents. That's Joe Lieberman and Sanders from Vermont. Those two independents have sided with the Democrats, and they will be organizing with the Democrats, thus giving the Democrats a majority in both of the houses. But first, let's get local. There was no more hotly contested and hotly debated issue than the Durrell sales tax. I asked Tommy and Anthony exactly what they were thinking about how this all came down. Here's what they had to say. We're, we're delighted. We're delighted that the people of Lafayette, you know, looked at this issue and um, came out overwhelmingly. I mean, we're talking about two-thirds of the public said no to this. 66 percent, 29,000 plus people versus not quite 15,000 for Durrell's side. And they were voting, you know, rational, uh, rationally into this thing. It wasn't, it wasn't an emotional thing. I mean, we were being, it was being presented to us that they had a $700 million solution to all our traffic problems in Lafayette. We debunked that, basically. And the Democrats stood up and took a position, one of the few people that did, and we were somewhat maligned by Joey Durrell and his bunch. That, you know, we really didn't know what we were talking about, and we hadn't really come to them and, and gotten all the facts, and it just none of that was true. The truth was that this was a rehashed bond issue deal that didn't have a plan. I think two things. I think... The first thing that it did is it exposes the old myth that Democrats tax and spend, spend and tax. In reality, ever since the Reagan years, it has been the Republicans who tax and spend, spend and tax. The second thing is that it shows that Republicans are not good stewards. They simply do not know how to deliver uh, on on not only on campaign promises, but when they're, when they're given the charge of money. They cannot produce the services that reflect the money that they're given. And I think that that's perhaps um, an indication that as a group, they think the party never ends. They think that there is no limit to the money tree. They can just shake it when they need it, and it'll be there. And so it's destroyed that myth, and it's probably called Mr. Durrell to be accountable, which has been lacking across the board since the Republicans have assumed majorities in many, many, many places. Nobody has made them account for their poor leadership. So in a sense, Mr. Durrell got what he deserved. He asked to be a leader. He's put in that position. He simply can't deliver. He couldn't deliver the votes didn't understand the disconnect was well if if but yeah but they're asking all this money now when we when they have a lot of money what are they going to do to us when they don't have any money and that was a legitimate question because there is a serious distrust of government today 
thanks to Bush and, you know, the past six years of flat out not being truthful with the American people with the war in Iraq and the war on terror and all the implications that comes down from that. Uh, in Durrell's case, um, what he has done is uh, he has done what President Bush has done, and he makes an enemy of anybody who doesn't agree with him. He wants, of course, your support because he needs it in order to get what he needs. But if you disagree with him, rather than enter into some kind of dialogue to figure out if perhaps he's making a mistake, he immediately assumes that you're against him and he attacks you. And of course, that creates nothing but division and conflict. And you see the byproduct of that. A lot of people I talk to, I can't do anything about the fact that my gasoline prices are going up. I mean, in the past year, gas prices have gone up. And in the next week, gas prices are going up because December, November 7th is over, right? right? I can't do anything about that. You're right. I can't do anything about the fact that my insurance is going up on my house, on my property, because of Katrina. Can't, I really can't do that. I can squawk, but that's that, too. And, you know, I can't do anything about the fact that my property's been reassessed and I'm paying higher property taxes for my home and buildings I own. I'm stuck with that. But I'm not stuck with voting a new tax on to myself with this one cent panacea road tax. So they said no to that. Uh, and apparently, you know, the mayor says even he got the message, you know, got the message that people don't want. His message was people are not, not for taxes and they're not that dissatisfied with the traffic. That's what I heard him say last night. Um, well, he got the message, you know, that, that, that people did not want his road tax. But the message is we want a plan for Lafayette. Everybody in Lafayette is concerned about the traffic. Everybody sits in it. It affects all of us. But we want to have something that's a plan so when $700 million is obligated, we'll, we will solve these problems and not add to them. Elected mayor, pre mayor president of, of the uh, Lafayette Parish. He's the, he's the mayor. He has the obligation of going around to these organizations, starting with us or ending with us, anywhere in between he wants to put. And not, and you know, you don't just say, I have a plan to uh, indenture the citizens for the next generation for three, uh, seven hundred million dollars, pushing a billion dollars, and, and then I'll just be in my office if anyone wants to talk to me about it. And if they don't come around, they haven't been responsible. No, he's elected to do this job. He's paid to do this job. He has a staff to do this job. And, they, and they, there's a big budget for these folks to do what they're doing. Now, no one came around and asked me or you or anybody from the Democratic Central Committee that they wanted to talk to us. So don't be crying about we didn't go and talk to you. That's foolish. So there's no oversight. There's no true planning. No one's told the builders when to, you know, draw it in and when to w w anything about reining in the builders that just keep dumping these these apartments and houses and everything onto the road system. They can't can't sustain what they have now. That's hard, and you know that's tough. That's making up a plan that wasn't presented to people, and then to have to ask the public to be financing state roads basically, and pay for what the state has an obligation to pay. People said enough's enough. And, you know, I, I had one, uh, and the press was kind of hostile towards, you know, when they interviewed me, they were, they were really picky about, why are you doing this, doing what? Taking a position against this wonderful tax. Everyone's for it. I said, whoa, 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 not everyone's for it. Where have you been? Uh, you know, have you been on leave in the White House? Are you a part of the White House Corps? Because they didn't get it either for six years. You know, what do you mean? I said, well, you, fo you follow the local news around here? There are nine uh, parish councilmen, am I right? right? Five makes up a majority. Right. So how many do you think voted against this one cent sales tax out of nine? He didn't know. Four. Four. One more and we wouldn't even have this debate. So yeah, there was opposition to it. There was, you know, four out of five, nine, uh, you know, one more and the majority against it. So elected officials were against it to start with. And the people were you know, against it, obviously, because they came out. Anytime you got a tsunami of 66% against 33%, you know, I don't care what you tell the public, the message has been delivered. Absolutely. And so, you know, that, yeah. Republicans stayed away from the topic because among themselves, they know that if you take historically and you look at economic policies beginning in 1980, that the Republicans tamper with, they they manipulate economic data to um, closet 
to camouflage what they're really about. I mean, we've had, the, under Republican leadership, beginning with Ronald Reagan, deficits were never uh, in, in line with reality. And yet, the, they use that same technique. What they're guilty of, they blame on other people. That projecting on others the very acts that they complain about. And so what, what's happened to the local Republican Party is this is it's exposing this, this fallacy that they continue to use. And by the way, Jendel does it. Uh, Vitter does it. Uh, Bustani did it. Now in his case, in Bustani's case, which brings up or makes a connection with the local Republican Party, Vitter, in, at least in Jendel to some extent, have the ability to... Um, argue the points because there's some substance there to their, at least their political uh, expertise. In Bustani's case, he's a lost ball in high weeds. I mean, he simply does not understand. Sooner or later, he's going to be called to account for his lack of ability and lack of knowledge. And um, I hope that, that the pressure begins to mount for him tomorrow yeah. uh, on, on some of those uh, economic uh, plans. And next up, the congressional races. Democrats have taken over both houses of Congress, as, as I said before, and the Senate will now be controlled by the Democrats. So with the House and the Senate now in the control of the Democrats, it'll be interesting to see how some things play out and what direction we're going to go in. However, first with the bad news. Regretfully, Mike Stagg was not able to unseat uh, Congressman Charles Bustani. However, he did an incredible job, and considering that he had roughly one-twentieth the money that Congressman Bustani spent, it's interesting to see that uh, Mike Stagg got almost 30% of the vote. He should be commended for that, and I don't believe we've seen the last of him, and I hope we haven't. Uh, so first off, let's talk with Anthony and Tommy exactly what they're thinking about how the races went down. First up, the Mike Stagg race. This is a, a personal plea to Mike. If he's still interested in, in, in a political future, he should use this opportunity to understand that uh, this fight is not over. I mean, not only did he do it on the $40,000, but he got into this raid very, very late. And he was able to get across a message that resonated, obviously, with a lot of people. I think if, if you look at anything from the Jindal um, Bustani races, they don't want to appear next to Democrats to answer questions. Right. And the reason they don't want to appear is they can't. There's a lot, it's the old, where's the beef, you know? There's a lot of fluff there. There's a lot of nice sounding, um, pleasant um, affirmations, but there's no substance to anything that these men or women have to offer, nothing at all. Yeah. It is impressive. And unfortunately, uh, one of the strategies of the Republican National Party that's an open secret now is to make politics so expensive that it breaks the average person who tries to uh, run for office. As a national study out came out last week that talks about to uh, cross the board to run for the United States Senate today and be competitive, you have to be prepared to spend seven million dollars. And to run for Congress and be competitive and, and, and expect to win. You have to be competitive and you've got to spend in the neighborhood of 1.5 to 2 million dollars. These are big bucks. And 75 percent of that money is always raised by business. Yeah. It's interesting, you know, so it comes from the business people. So, hey, it's not hard if you want to keep a guy, you get a guy elected and then you make it so darned expensive that no one else can run against him. You, you've, uh, you've accomplished what you're looking to do. Courage for Mike to do that. And here's why I say it. I don't think Mike's naive. I think Mike is very, very bright. As a matter of fact, as between Bustani and, and Mike uh, Stagg, Louisiana really lost an opportunity to have somebody in there who's very, very capable. So I think Mike entered that race knowing that it was going to be a tough, tough battle. And I think the votes that he got, based upon the money that he had, meant that he didn't manufacture an image. I mean, he didn't go out 
and pr present a product. He presented a person who had real ideas for a real change, and I think it began to take hold. Now, the, you know, it takes a heck of a person and to to lose on that in that type of campaign and to stay in the fight. And and if he's listening to this broadcast, he needs to stay in the fight. He needs to stay in the fight because his ideas now are out there and they need to be nurtured and they need to they need to propagate and if we can we can we can take back the seventh congressional district That's true. it's just a, it's just a matter of time Absolutely. he was he was effectively shut out of this race by dollars and you know i think uh bustani lucked out and ducked out you know he lucked out because he was a a sitting republican congressman and they gave him all the money he needed to run he ducked out because he didn't have the courage or the moral fortitude to debate any of these issues, right. to stand up and talk about minimum wage and what it meant in Lafayette, Louisiana, or Lake Charles, or the, the real, where the real people are, where that 66% is that voted against the one-cent sales tax that made a difference in their life. Yeah. So uh, Mr. Bustan has got to run every two years. That's the good news in this. And I don't think that we as Democrats, who are now in the majority in the House of Representatives, and I think will be before the day, this day is over, a majority in the Senate, or have control of the Senate with the independent votes that we can claim, uh, I don't think that the next race of Mr. Bustani will be the same. He's not going to have a, a Republican organization awash in money. He's not going to have another free ride. Basically, he got a free ride. And you know, you know what Charlie has that, that I think came through in the campaign? What you see with Charlie is what you get. Yeah. There's no, there's nothing manufactured there, right. you know. I mean, Charlie was out front arguing and defending the sugar producers when the rest of the world could care less about what happened to, to sugar producers in South Louisiana. And he did it at a time when there really wasn't anything in it for him. Right. I mean, he just did it because he felt that was the right thing to do. And he, by the way, he was out there fighting for the shrimpers, and he was out there fighting for the, roos, the rice producers. Let me tell you, the people don't realize that at the, the very time of that first election, the Bush administration had given a huge rice contract to Vietnam. You know, of all places. Now, here, our sons and daughters from Louisiana died over there. Yeah. And when it came time to get oil contracts, it went to Halliburton. When it came time for rice contracts, it went to Vietnam. You know, Malonso was speaking out against both of those things at the same time. And, you know, and, and that was, uh, was a bare-knuckle, hard-fought, dirty campaign sure. that, you know, he, he suffered a lot of... Uh, a lot to, to, to be reelected and, and went through a lot personally. And uh, I think he's, a, he's an excellent senator, a uh, representative. You know, maybe one day he will be a United yeah. States senator. I think uh, I was delighted, and, and I never doubted for a minute that Charlie would, would come back. He, he won by 500 votes the first time, yeah. but he, he won by what, over 15%, 15 time, yeah. better, you know. And he's, to 40. He's, he's, uh, he's proved himself. He's been a, a marvelously good congressman, yeah. and, you know, we can be really proud of him. In, in uh, Craig's case, Craig lost because he's Craig Romero. He has a history that followed him around like an albatross. Um, it, it is not a great history as a, um, as a um, legislator, uh, as the commercial, sh uh, the um, publicity showed throughout the campaign. Craig has done very well for himself as a legislator. And so uh, it's not surprising that Charlie Melanson beat him. You know, Jefferson is a, uh, it's a shame that, that he had to stand for re-election in the shadow of something that, uh, for all practical purposes, uh, it appears that he could have prevented that. Okay. Now, I don't like to judge anyone before all the facts are in. I do not believe that we should ever, as Americans, take lightly the idea that a man is innocent until proven guilty. Once we do that, once as Americans we give up that presumption, then indeed we are all in serious, serious jeopardy. Having said that, um, I think that in Jefferson's case, if the accusations are true, and only he knows whether they're really true or not, um, then I think it was ill-advised for him 
to, to stay. I think what he should have done, I don't believe that a man has to go in and not defend himself, but I think he should have looked at that race and he should have done what would have been best for the people in that district. Now, I don't believe that he's going to survive a runoff. I think Karen Carter will beat him. Um, he's done a lot of great things for the New Orleans area. Uh, and it's just uh, tragic that, that if, it, if it does come out that he is indicted and he's tried and convicted or pleads guilty, that, his, that a wonderful career had to end on that note. Yeah. I was very uh, you know, disappointed in, in this whole thing. I'm a criminal defense attorney. So I understand the presumption of innocence, and he certainly has that. I'm also a person who follows and loves politics. If you get caught with $90,000 in your freezer and you're running for office today, you probably won't get reelected. Right. I don't think he will. I don't think he deserves to. Yeah. And Nancy Pelosi, if she becomes, if she becomes the uh, Speaker of the House, I'm happy for her. She's obviously a talented woman. She survived in an era when it, was, when it would have been tough for many Democrats to survive and even tougher for many female Democrats to survive. Um, I hope that the, the objective of the House is to turn to those, some of the things that are badly needed, like minimum wage, that they, they fix the problem with the elderly and, and prescription drugs. Yeah, I mean, drug companies have taken advantage of their position in the government uh, to, to the point that they have abused those people whom everything in religion tells us we should honor. Right. You know, they're at a point that they've done their part in building this country, making they've it great. Yeah. They've contributed. And now we're squabbling with petty things about whether or not they should be paying for medication. And if we're first time for a woman, yeah. and, she, and she's a marvelous woman. Yeah, I like Nancy Pelosi a lot. And she's going to be even-handed. She's going to, you know, there are some immediate things that have to be done. Well, you know, the, the Republican Party is a classic example right now of sort of the, the Sandlot football team. They had it all. They had everything that they could ask for. And we can go through that litany. They had the presidency, the vice presidency, both houses. They controlled the Supreme Court since 19... Uh, 88. Uh, nobody realizes that, but they have. They had it all. They just didn't have what America needs. Yeah. You know, they had. In other words, they had the money. They had the power. They just didn't have the substance. So, the fact that they crashed and burned is not surprising to me. When you, the whole, the whole point behind the the uh, Wizard of Oz is that when they get to the Emerald City, they get to look behind the curtain and the wizard isn't anybody, right. that's the Republican Party. There is nothing there for middle America. There's nothing there for working class families. Right. Working class Americans have no reason to be Republican because the Republicans do nothing for them. Right. I mean, the, a good example is the economy that President Bush was talking about this morning. The, the economy may be doing well, and it may be running marvelously for the upper 1%. But for the unfortunate 300,000, 300 million, whatever it is, whatever you want to, numerical number you want to put on it, it, it hasn't been great. Yeah. And so they crashed and burned because they have nothing to offer. Right. You know, all, it was kind of the perfect storm of, of everything coming together for the American people to, to do this, what they did. And this was a national referendum on President Bush on Iraq. I mean, you know, the, it's, no, it's no coincidence that uh, Donald Rumsfeld uh, resigned this afternoon. Right. So, you know, the news cycle, the news is driven in cycles. It's, it's supposed to be today. The real news is, the top of the news is Democrats take the House. Looks like they're going to take the Senate. And, you know, what dire implications for Bush presidency. The main thing that this means for the country, to me, as a Democrat and as an American, is that we now have subpoena power. Yeah. And we can now, the one thing the Bush administration never counted on in six years, none of these people, Cheney, Rumsfeld, Perlman, you, you know, I'll, you just go down the list. They never accounted o on the fact that one day they would be held accountable. Right. There, was no gonna, there was no accountability in this administration. No one has ever been fired in this administration. No one has been criticized. All the disasters we've had. Uh, pushing 3,000 deaths in Iraq in a, a wrong war, misled about the information. I mean, it'd be like, 
uh, in World War II, the, the analogy has been used that, you know, when we were attacked at Pearl Harbor by the Japanese, we then go and bomb Mexico. That's how much sense it made to invade Iraq. It made none whatsoever. There was no threat there. There were no weapons of mass destruction. Then that changed to, well, we, we bring, we'll be greeted as liberators with flowers. That didn't happen. Then it, we'll bring in democracy to Iraq. We have a put-up government in Iraq that's falling apart. That and we're in the middle of a civil war with our troops being killed every day for no reason, yep. none. And it's, it's tragic. So the American people stepped up and spoke on that. Yep. And we're going to have subpoena power through the House of Representatives for, sh for sure to uh, get these people to come front and center and explain before the cameras, before the nation, how we got into this mess so that history learns. Right. You know, and, and hopefully this will never be done again. Right. This will never happen again. That's an, a national issue. This was, you know, I want to thank Rush Limbaugh personally on this show. Rush Limbaugh, and more than any American out there, is responsible for the Democrats taking the uh, Missouri Senate seat with Senator McCaskill because he, he insulted Michael J. Fox and he made fun of him and he, he berated him on national and it was caught and it was played and it gave attention to the stem cell research uh, issue yeah. big time sure. and, and, and it made a difference in Missouri, where, which is where Rush Limbaugh's from, by the way. Right. Interesting. The President of the United States, the United States Senate, and the United States House of Representatives must look at the Iraq problem in, in level, at levels of importance. The primary, their, their primary importance right now, or for those men and women in the field, soldiers, I mean, these men and women are putting their lives on the line every single day. Now, aside from the fact that um, we can look at how they got there right. and we can debate about whether or not Bush was an honest broker when he brought this, when he laid this tragedy at our door. The simple fact of the matter is they are there. And so the primary focus needs to be their safety, their honor, and their return. And, and, and I don't think we can compromise either of those things. We cannot compromise their safety. We have no right to compromise their honor. And we have to make sure that they do return, and they return safely, yeah, and soon. Having said that, we have a secondary obligation. And that is to the American people, because we are a constitutional government. And when, when, when our public leaders undermine the very document that forms the basis for our country, then our entire democracy is at stake. A competing interest with that is the absolute horror the Bush administration has created over there in Iraq. The number of people who are killed and are dying. And so trying to juggle those three levels of concern with the fourth one, which is just the national honor as a result of this, is a, is a very, very difficult thing. It's not going to be an easy thing to resolve, uh, especially if you start looking at it in the layers of where we, we have to turn to first and, and, and where our allegiances are, because those people in the field, it doesn't make any difference to a mother or father what their political what the, the political climate is or even what a person's opinion is when a child or boy or girl or whomever is over there and comes back in a pine box or comes back maimed. I mean, our primary, our primary focus needs to be with those individuals that are over there experiencing this every sure. day. And then try to work this out in a way that we can look back on this part of history, which may be very difficult to do, and see some something of value from it. I mean, it's not very it's not very hopeful now that we can without great effort. And unfortunately, um, the sad thing today was to listen to President Bush say that he expected Baker and others to form a commission. Well, that's what the leader of the country is supposed to do. And if he's not going to do it, if he has to go outside of his administration to get it done, then that's probably a good indication that he doesn't have the ability. He ought to think about resigning and turning the government over to somebody who can 
come up with these solutions in the position as President of the United States. Right. Everything changes. The whole landscape changes. There'll be no more free rides for these, these um, ultra-conservatives that don't really understand and respect the Constitution. Right. And, and it's going be, to be incredibly important because we, you know, this, really this court hinges right now on Justice Kennedy. Yeah. What happens with him? He is now the swing vote. And, um, and Justice Kennedy's not a young man. No. He's in his 80s. Democrats have picked up the governor's mansion in six states. That's a huge sweeping control. They took the over the state uh, governor's mansions in Ohio, Arkansas, Massachusetts, Maryland, Colorado, and New York. New York. That's great. Uh, that means that out of our 50 states, 28 of the states have Democratic governors now. So I asked Anthony and Tommy, what does this mean specifically for the country? Here's what they had to say. Well, I think that in the, in the case of the governors, they realized uh, probably before most of the nation that President Bush had nothing to offer uh, local uh, governments. As a matter of fact, these, these unfunded mandates that he strapped to the local governments have caused much of these problems. I can remember at some of the governor's conferences that even the Republican governors were making pleas to him to stop the theatrics, right. stop the histrionics of, of making, making himself look good at the expense of local governments. And to use a, a, an old uh, adage, the chickens came home to roost. Uh, there is a statement that all, all uh, politics is local. And in the case, at least, of these governor's races, that, that certainly is, is true. I, you know, today, Bush was still speaking proudly about no child left behind. Now, he still hasn't gotten the message by local governments that, that while that may sound great, and it makes a great sound bite for a national campaign, it hasn't done anything except create expense, unfunded expense at the at the hands of local governments who are already strapped it's 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 huge in the standpoint that i think you have a majority uh nationwide now of, of uh, democratic governors versus republican governors 28. 28 28 fantastic that means that you know the governors are important critical to national politics because ultimately the state legislatures draw the redistricting lines right. Now, we know what that meant with Tom DeLay with an abuse of that power. But um, the lines are going to be drawn from time to time. I mean, this country is 300 million people now. When I was uh, a kid, it was 200. When, when LBJ was president, it was 200 million. Right. It's going to be 400 million, uh, you know, in, in the next generation. Yeah. So these lines are going to be redrawn. And it's nice to know that uh, Democrats, uh, you know, will be in charge of where those lines are drawn. Makes me very happy.